Lord Jesus and Heavenly Father, we thank you oh so much for the things you bless us with each and every day. We know they're truly by grace. And please be with us now as we get into your word to understand it and apply it in the right way. Thank you oh so much as we pray in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Continuing our Explain the Word series in the book of Acts. We'll pick it right up here at the beginning of Acts. Where it reads, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. A very important point here is through the Holy Ghost. He chose the apostles. They were indwelt with the Holy Ghost. Just as all believers, when they trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, are indwelt with the Holy Ghost and through the power and the guidance of the Holy Ghost, we can be led on the pathway we need to be on, having that indwelling guide right there within us and gives us understanding and wisdom, even the other things we need, such as boldness and so forth. But as it continues, verse 3, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus, after he rose from that grave, he stuck around some forty days, still preaching and teaching and guiding them. We don't have a lot of record of that forty days. A few things have been recorded in the Gospels. And, of course, right here at the beginning of Acts. But we know through the teachings and the writings of the apostles that we have throughout the rest of the New Testament, evidence of the further teaching directly by the Lord in their presence during this 40 days, plus what they were taught through the indwelling Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? This was a common misbelief about the Old Testament writings of the establishment of the millennial kingdom, that they thought that when he came there in the flesh and was living amongst them, that that was when he was going to reestablish the kingdom. And then even as, at his resurrection here, they were thinking that, are you going to go ahead and establish the kingdom now? But that's for the future, as he tells him here. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And after they were indwelt with the Holy Ghost, it's very evident in their actions and in the wisdom that they had once the Spirit of the Holy Ghost come into them. As it continues, And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven." He was actually raptured up right there in front of them, giving them the example of what we will all be raptured in the future, up to be with the Lord. And he also told them back in John chapter 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So he's told them over and over what's going to happen. And here we see 
the first part of that going away that they were able to witness him ascending up to the Father. And he will be there until he returns in the clouds and raptures up the church. And then the tribulation time kicks in and so forth. And then at the millennial period, at the end of the tribulation time, at the establishment of the millennial period, he'll actually come down to the earth, step foot once again on the earth and establish that kingdom that they were thinking that he was going to establish when he was here before, as it said over there in verse 6. They had their timeline confused, like many others have done. But we see here what happens after he tells them this, and he ascends up to the Father. In verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Very interesting point I want to bring out here is and with his brethren. This is the first reference we see of his brethren here actually speaking of his brothers and sisters because it was Mary, his mother, and his brethren. His family finally recognized Jesus Christ for who he truly is, had rejected him up until this point. No clear indication that they were followers of any sort up until this point. And then finally, they're followers. Because we know it's accredited to his two brothers, James and, and Judas, who renamed himself Jude, after what Judas Iscariot did, wrote the two books that we have recorded in the New Testament. So they became followers. They became disciples after his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. Then they finally said, so now we truly can see and believe Verse 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about an hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Now we know he went and hanged himself, but apparently he hung there so long that the rope rotted, and he fell, and of course by then he was pretty rotted himself, and just burst Verse 19, And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in the proper tongue, a seldoma, which is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Now here where it says bishopric, it means his bishop, his, his field of of service, his place in the ministry is what he's speaking of. Let someone else step up and take his place in the ministry. That's where Peter got the idea that it was up to them to choose the next apostle to fill that space that Judas had left. And they do what we see here next. Wherefore, of these men which have campaigned with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So Peter himself, as bold as he is, and so many times sticking his foot in his mouth and doing stuff he really shouldn't be doing, has stepped up and said, because Judas betrayed the Lord, no longer a disciple or apostle, therefore it's up to us to choose a replacement for Judas. It wasn't up to him. It wasn't up to him at all. The Lord chose the apostles. 
not the other apostles. But Peter thought, well, it's his job to do it now. He stepped up to do this. Note as it unfolds. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Matthias. This is the only mention you see of Matthias. As being chosen by Peter and the others, this, they gave forth their lots. Now the casting of lots is like a pair of dice. And they cast the dice and then they see the number. Or in this case, it's probably they voted amongst themselves, and the majority went toward Matthias. So they gave forth their lots, their own decisions, so these apostles that were there chose the next apostle, which is not how it works. But yet that's what they did. Now, there's no other reference to Matthias in the rest of the New Testament. He wasn't the apostle He was chosen by the apostles to be an apostle, but he was not. The Lord himself chose the replacement for Judas when he chose Saul on a road to Damascus, appearing to Saul, personally telling Saul to go out. And that's what being an apostle is, to be sent out by the Lord. The Lord didn't appear to Matthias and choose him to go out, but Peter and his group did. So we've got to always be careful when we try to step up and take charge of something that's the job of the Lord to do, not us. We've got to step in and say, well, well, this is the will of the Lord because we cast lots and that must be what happened because that's what turned out. No, the Lord chooses. And it's clear, as we see through the histories, Matthias didn't do any great works. He was chosen by them, but all he did was take the title. All right, let's roll on into chapter 2, and we see now the event that's going to change these men into something different. Because this event of casting lots and choosing Matthias was done by them that were not yet filled with the Holy Ghost. So they didn't have the wisdom and true understanding of the will of the Lord yet. But now we see that they get indwelt with the Holy Ghost and become then more correct in their behavior and more bold in their preaching and more courageous during the persecutions. Chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, now Pentecost is penta, penta is a word that means 50. And 50 was 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which was the Passover. So Passover and then all the way over to Pentecost is 50 days. It was a, a day of celebration by the Jews. You should go all the way back into the Mosaic Law and see the references to that. But as we continue. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Other tongues. Other languages. The speaking of tongues is one of the things that have been misunderstood and misused ever since this event right here. It was used by so many in the past and still today to try to bring honor and glory to the individual who is speaking in tongues. Now, there are groups out there that they'll hop up and they'll dance around the church and they'll spew out some kind of gibberish that nobody on the planet can understand. 
That is not speaking in tongues. That's just somebody hooting and hollering and spewing out junk. That doesn't bring honor to the Lord. That doesn't help anybody. Nobody can understand what you're saying. And you have others that say that they know they can translate what those people are saying. Well, if that person is truly indwelt with the Holy Ghost and stands up and speaking in another language and somebody else in that room knows that language and can interpret it, then you can look at that as being more accurate and possibly true. The purpose of speaking in tongues is the purpose to be able to communicate the gospel to other languages, to other nations, other peoples. Given a person an ability to be able to speak another language that they were not born speaking, not born speaking, but did not learn to speak after they were born, I should say. So you have these individuals that are pretending to be holy and righteous, spewing out gibberish, pretending that they are indwelt with the Holy Ghost, but really they are not. But be careful when you try to determine whether someone is doing it properly or not. Unless you happen to know every language that has ever been spoke on the planet. Because there are some out there that are truly indwelt with the Holy Ghost that do speak in tongues, speak in other languages that they were not taught at a young age. Now, does this mean that when you get old enough to where you can start learning foreign languages, that when you learn a foreign language, that that's evident that the Holy Ghost is in you? Very could well be. Because the Lord gives us ability to understand anything and everything that we study as being right and wrong and true and false. Therefore, if he wants us to have the ability to speak another language in order to spread the gospel, he can give that to us and we can learn another language. And then when we speak another language, then we are speaking in tongues another language to spread the gospel. That was the purpose of spreading, I mean, excuse me, that was the purpose of the indwelling spirit of the Holy Ghost, giving them the gift of tongues as we see it unfolding right here. The first example of speaking in tongues and the purpose thereof. All right, read 4 again, Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Not as they had the opportunity to show off to somebody that they could do it. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language, not a, a gibberish that no one could understand. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So they would expect the Galileans to speak the language of the Galileans. But they were able to speak all of them, as he gets into the list here. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. That's the purpose. To be able to communicate to others that you were never able to communicate to and teach and preach to them in their language. Just like the missionaries that we have that go all over the world that are able to learn the languages of the foreign nations and speak to them and spread the gospel. They are speaking in tongues. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the uh, eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in, at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. 
For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, which would be nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that was a wonderful thing to say right there that we hold true today. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all it takes is to call upon the name of the Lord and He'll save you and dwell you with the Holy Ghost and put you on a pathway to serve the Lord. And this shows the boldness of Peter standing up and starting to preach this. And this was because he was now indwelt with the Holy Ghost and could say things correctly and do things correctly. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I might that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Holy one to receive corruption, speaking of Jesus Christ in the grave, he didn't lay there and rot. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of his of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, the descendant of David, as you can follow the bloodline of Mary all the way back to David. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So reference to Jesus Christ, now sitting on the right hand of the Father, and has sent down and made available to all of us that trust in him to receive the Holy Ghost into us, to never leave us. Verse 34, For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The key there, to repent, it means to turn away from their evil ways. Call upon the Lord. Because like you said over there in verse 21, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what he's speaking of here. When you repent and you become saved, saved from a, an eternity in the lake of fire, indwelt with the Holy Ghost, the guide, the comforter, the spirit of truth. 
Verse 39. For the promises come unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. A very important verse. As many as the Lord our God will call. He does the calling in. He allows us to be a part of His work. Never try to take credit for the work of the Lord for yourself. It's His work. He allows you to be a part of it. That's all. Here He's acknowledging. Verse 39 again. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. That means the entire world, all mankind. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls. That was an awesome result from that message being delivered. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers and Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continually daily, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So here we see the beginning of the New Testament church. And the devotion of the new believers to help each other. They didn't sell their their possessions and give it to the world. They didn't make donations to the local charities. They were helping the sinful folks stay in their sinful lives which is what we see of most charities in the world today. All they do is help others live comfortably in their sinful lives. It's important that we always note here and elsewhere where the Lord focuses our giving needs to be to bring honor and glory to the Lord, to expand the kingdom, to help the brethren, the church, help the believers, not the building, that's what I'm talking about, the building, Help the church, the body of Christ. That's where the focus needs to be. Help one another in that way. And that's what they were focused on. And when we do that, then we're glorifying the Lord in the right way. And I love here in verse 47 again where it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord added to it. They weren't trying to take credit for themselves. The Lord added to the church daily. So we ought to always give God credit for credit is due for His work. And thank the Lord that He allows us to be a part of His work. Let's pray. Lord Jesus and Heavenly Father, we thank You oh so much for allowing us to be a part of Your work, for allowing us to be part of Your family, for calling us in, because we know it was truly by Your call that we responded. And help us to encourage others to listen up to your call as well. Give us that opportunity to shine your light and share your love into this dark world. We thank you oh so much for all of it. As we pray in Jesus' precious holy name, amen. Thank you all.